A very good morning to you. Thank you for choosing this session. We have very tough competition in some of the other rooms, so we appreciate your active engagement in this session. I'm David Rowan, the founding editor-in-chief of the UK edition of Wired, which is a publication seeking stories about innovation, the people changing the world, whether in business models, in science, in technology. And we're here today to talk about innovation, in particular, how big, established, successful companies can learn from the startup agility, the startup mindset, the ability to move as quickly as changing demands of your customers. And we have an exceptional group of people to share, but also some amazing people in the room who we're going to involve in the conversation as the morning continues. So from the world of startups, next to me with 70 employees um, in between the US and China, Yao Zhang, who started a business called Roboterra about three years ago, which is a smart and fast-growing company helping educate people in creative new ways, building skill sets around robotics and coding and tech in a very accessible way. And we're going to talk to Yao about how you manage that early stage of growth and work out where the opportunities are. Um, we have a gentleman from a slightly more established family originated business. Um, you may well already know Andrei Kudelski. His um, father started a business back in 1951, created a rather smart tape recorder called the Nagra. And since then, now Andre is running it. It's a 4,000 person business, a Swiss business, where, among other things, they're responsible for ensuring digital security for broadcast companies and subscription tech to make sure the right people are enjoying the content. And among other things, Andre is also in charge of innovation for the Swiss government. So we're going to talk about how you develop new types of snow, milk, and startups. And um, finally, next to Andre is a man who's made um, an interesting journey recently, Mark McGann. He was at Uber, running European operations and helping build a huge global operation at rapid scale. And now he's working to help an established company with a big telecoms business um, disrupt itself. The business is called Vion. It's um, not a new business because it renamed itself in February from Vimpelcom. Started back in the early 90s and last time I saw, I think it was the sixth largest mobile operator in the world operating um, mobile services such as Beeline, such as Wind, such as <coughs> Jezzy in many countries, particularly in Eastern Europe. And it's a $10 billion revenue company with about 45,000 employees. And we're going to explore how a company like this can evolve as traditional views of what a telco industry are being undermined by the way we're using our devices, the way we're consuming bandwidth, the way we're shopping around for different types of products. Um, but I'm going to start framing the discussion, which is essentially about what corporates and startups can learn from each other with um, my own personal quest. I'm on a journey this year to write a book. I'm in search of genuine corporate innovation because I meet a lot of senior executives in all sorts of different industries who say, yes, we do innovation. We have a head of innovation. Or we have a corporate incubator in another city. And generally, there are kind of disappointing results. And what I'm finding is if the person running the business is not the chief innovation officer, it's very hard to change a culture. But also I'm finding there are very few 
proven concrete models for a big established company to radically transform its business, to reframe its value. And we can talk about some of the examples that I'm seeing that are interesting in sectors from banking to airlines. Um, but I just want to start by asking Mark, when you are taking on a almost 50,000 person business and the rebranding to Vion was partly to signal you're not a telecommunications business as much as a technology business. How do you think inside the company you can make it much more survivable as business models, as consumer expectations change? I think what we, what we learn from the startup culture is that you have to be customer obsessed. You have to be laser focused on the product and on the customer to the exclusion of everything else. Uh, and you know, Uber has been very successful in disrupting uh, almost a century old monopoly by being focused on how to move people around their cities uh, cheaply, efficiently, safely. And the telecommunications industry, which used to be a nat national monopoly in so many countries, has in turn been disrupted by, in this case, Silicon Valley startups, um, such as WhatsApp, all of these so-called OTT, over-the-top platforms, leading to a situation today where you know, we're operating the number one and number two mobile network in 12 countries. You know, we provide telecommunications to 250 million people every day. But selling voice and data is becoming a rapidly commoditized business because of this disruption. So if you use WhatsApp, or more likely in China, if you use WeChat, you're no longer used to having to pay to communicate with your friends, with your family, with your colleagues. So when you're sitting back and you've invested billions of dollars in, in infrastructure, in spectrum, in operations, in people, and Silicon Valley startups say, okay, that's lovely, but you now have to give that away for free, you better hurry up and reinvent yourself. You better hurry up and reinvent your business model. And where large corporates such as Vion can learn from startups is if you are customer obsessed, if you're focused, laser focused on the product that you are building, and if you really have this sense of mission, you know, the mission of Uber, as Travis Kalanick said here at Summer Davos last year, was transportation is reliable as running water. If you have a mission, as Vion has a mission, to lead the personal internet revolution in our emerging markets where smartphone penetration doesn't go above 20%, then you can emulate the successful startups and reinvent yourself. Share any examples of concrete steps your team are taking to do this inside the company. Well, I mean, this requires massive investments. You know, last year alone, we spent um, almost two billion US dollars with Chinese companies, former startups, Huawei, ZTE, on building the infrastructure. Uh, but in terms of understanding how we can monetize the customer relationship, other than selling voice and data, we actually go to the startup culture. Uh, previously, like all big corporates, we had corporate social responsibility programs, uh, sponsoring this, sponsoring that, sponsoring football teams, et cetera, et cetera. We stopped all that. And we focused on one thing, which is entrepreneurship and innovation, building incubators in all of our markets. We've built the biggest technology facility in Pakistan. Isla Islamabad, you wouldn't realize, is a hive of innovation and startups. Uh, and by sponsoring spaces and providing services to these startups that they otherwise couldn't afford, we learn through sharing ideas through osmosis, and we learn what only a 25-year-old can teach you if they're focused on a mission and they're not worried about failing. We learn to focus on what it is the customer expects us to provide rather than the old mindset, which is what we want to provide to the customer. How do you ensure that the specific product development and the thinking of the incubator leap to the top of the parent company? I mean, it's very hard. You have to uh, change the mindset of 
people who have engineered a certain product because they were told, they were taught that telecommunications is a thriving, profitable business. But it all comes back to the device that you have in your hand, which anyone's teenage child will tell them. That's not no longer a luxury, it's a right. It's my interface with everything I do in life. Uh, and learning from these startups, new applications, uh, going beyond financial services, going beyond sharing of music or sharing of, of video. Um, you really have to make sure that you hire the new digital mindsets. You know, the, not everybody goes to work in a startup. Some very bright young people want to come and work in an established company so they can grow and they can learn. So it's, there's this artificial division between you know, the, the uh, very innovative startups and the old, creaky, slow <laughs> corporates. I, I don't believe that that is uh, a good depiction of reality. It does come down to talent, which we'll talk about um, in a bit. Andre, you are running, I guess, an almost 70-year-old startup. And you're also in a fairly fast-changing technology space. How do you, inside your business, think about protecting yourself from the changes that are going to hit you in the face in the next five, ten years? I'm not, I don't think that it's about protecting against the change, is taking the opportunity of the change. But I would just first come back to one specific event. When I tried to reinvent the company, it was in the early 90s. And one of the key elements, and uh, Chinese will understand that, is the concept of one company, two system. And one element that is extremely important in a company is that if you have a well-established business, the rules that you need to apply and the way you manage it are very different from a startup one. But you need, at the same time, in a company, to be able to have the two systems coexisting. And that is not so easy because, on one side, you may have some very tough rules for the existing business, and you need to give more freedom to the ones that are disruptive. And that is really, the art is to be able to have under one roof two different systems, and you cannot have only advantage and disadvantage in one place versus another one. So you need to have a fine balance to have a one part of the company where you can take risks, the other one where you need to have tight uh, processes. And that is really <coughs> one of the most fascinating elements is to make the two parts of the company accepting that the rules are not automatically the same. And I, as an example, one thing extremely important is to be ready first to hire people that are very young and to give to this young person some responsibility with the right to fail. Because one of the fundamental elements for innovation and to be successful here is to be able to take risk, calculated risks, so you should not bankrupt the completely company, but basically have people young that are able to take some risk and to make a bet. And that is something that is extremely fascinating, is to see how younger uh, people are ready to take risk because maybe they don't know what are the consequences of failure. And that is what may be fascinating. I can share a case study, actually, that I've been working on for my book, which is um, the origins of Tinder, the dating app mm -hmm. that's growing very fast in the West. It was actually created in an incubator owned by Interactive Corporation, which owns the big incumbent, Match.com, the online dating site. And Interactive Corporation acquired an incubator called Hatch Labs and got a bunch of 20-somethings. And it was actually on the same floor in HQ as Match.com and said, go and play. Here's a bit of budget. You don't need to account for the risks you're taking. And they made a bunch of apps. Many of them didn't work. One of them started as an attempt to create a loyalty program for retailers. And I talked to one of the founders, Whitney Wolf, last week. She said she went door to door to cafes saying, sign up, it's great, no interest. And then she thought, why don't I go back to my college and go back to the fraternities and the sororities and get people to sign up to a slightly redesigned app that maybe they could use to meet each other and that it exploded under the nose of the parent company. So there are ways 
if you give people freedom. I just want to ask you, Andre, you talked about giving part of the company permission to take risks. Are there any examples of risk taking that you've already seen inside the group that you think could be new product lines, new revenue streams? Yes, I have seen a number of them because we are in a sector where you need to reinvent yourself every few years. So uh, as an example, we have started cybersecurity as a new entity, and that was some risks that was taken, and we see now this initiative really growing. But the key thing is to be ready to fail if needed, and the best way to be successful is to be ready to fail, if I can say that. So, yeah, you've had more recent experience of building a new business, creating a new market, sourcing the talent, which is a very difficult thing. As we know, most startups don't make it. What skill sets, what mindset do you think it takes now to build a company from an idea to 70 people to an increasingly global audience? I definitely think that the mindset part is the most important part. Um, um, if I recall how, you know, how the founding team members of Roboterra get together in the spring of 2014, um, several of the team members were still working at the, you know, some of the, the top largest uh, tech companies in the valley. And then you know, we were with a background in hardware, software, AI, or you know, cognitive science, myself more from data background. And then we just got together at 4 or 5 p.m. every day and then worked till 3 a.m. every day. We just, um, there are many, so our product is in educational robotics. There are many ways to define the product and define really the very specific need, uh, the need that we can address. So we just decided to work very fast and then bring the prototypes in front of the uh, potential users, students and uh, robotics clubs at some of the top um, schools who already had championships from some of the competitions. So we just work with them, let, let the users tell us what are the issues, what are the other pain points they still have that we can improve our work to address those issues. So by adopting this way of uh, very, uh, you know, uh, interacting with our market. We all, we call it talk with the market. Even as a hardware company, we also have this method of talking with the market, get feedback very, very fast, so that in our iteration of um, just so many design aspects of the product, we're able to iterate fast enough. And then um, by interacting with the market, we also start to receive recognitions such as uh, into the fourth month of our operation, we already um, were invited by the Tech Museum, uh, Tech Innovation Museum in, uh, in, in the Valley um, to do a large demo to hundreds of families. And then from there, attention from media, from investors came, and then that's how the company actually really launched. So you're not so much building a company as building an ecosystem where you have an inbuilt feedback loop. Um, yes, that loop is very important. But we, uh, but, but but the main driver in uh, you know in how we work is the product mm. itself. This is something I've seen in a few fast-growing Chinese companies. Actually, if you look at OnePlus that makes the handset, they take a lot of their ideas for the software and also the hardware from their online forums, and they update the software each week, crediting I think people who have helped iterate. And also Xiaomi yeah. in Beijing <laughs> has parties for their fans, yes. for the me fans. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, one tool that the successful organizations could be using to get that very, very quick iteration cycle. Um, you talked about people coming from other businesses, high positions in other businesses. You have talent at the heart of the business. When you're hiring new people, and startups can hire very quickly. How do you ensure that the new talent shares the cultural values, shares the mindset of the founders? Yes, um, I want to share very honest stories. So um, I think 
at different stages of a startup, the talent strategy is ve very different. For example, when we are in our first year, um, throughout 2014, uh, we had less than 20 people of that year. We consider everyone really being, <clears throat> really being one of the core founding team members. So, um, <clears throat> so the qualities of, of those talents that we try to engage in that process was very different. For example, you know, year one, I, we definitely would share the direction we're going, why this is a great market as a startup. We have tremendous opportunities there. Um, um, so, so share the potential, share the vision, and then really identify the people with the right uh, the right values and the same belief. And then skill sets is even you know, the thing after that. Uh, and also because we just share honestly, you know, year one we had seed money, but we don't plan to even give salaries. It, would this be okay? So that's how we really got the very core of the core founding team members. And then we keep growing, especially when we had early um, paid clients start to sign on board. And then you know, the business we saw, uh, 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 um, traction start, uh, uh, start to happen. Um, so uh, entering into year two, when the, when, when the company is expanding from like 14-ish to you know ended uh, with like 35, so we start to uh, to uh, take more of the uh, regular recruiting strategies. We offer market competitive rate on top of the fact that we are a fast-growing company in a very promising market. So each each stage is just very different. So I, I want to get a little bit of kind of honest backwards and forwards now between the startup member of our discussion and the incumbent members. So, you, yeah, if you were in Mark's shoes, let's say, 45,000 employees, recently refocused the face of the company to emphasize that it's a technology company, not a communications company. But it still has a legacy. It still has ways of thinking that have been built up over decades. You're brought in there to tell him what he could usefully do with that startup mindset. He promises not to criticize you, but what would you tell him? <laughs> well, um, it's definitely a huge honor you know, to, to think in that situation, but uh, I guess I will ask those questions. Um, after careful studying and reviewing all aspects of, of operations of the business, um, I'll reconsider, are we really doing the things that we have to do? that we can be 10 times better than everyone else. And then I probably will focus on those, you know, the, the killer fields that we are about. And then I will, uh, the second question I ask, do we really need 45,000 people? If not anymore, then what's a plan? You know, because we still have to take care very well of all our employees because for any size company, I believe talent is always a core asset. And then step three, I probably would think, um, you know, it's a, a large corporation. There, of course, will be many uh, departments supporting each other. But I would still ask, can all the, you know, are all the cost centers, can only be cost centers? Is there any way I can turn them, reinvent them into profit centers as well? That's why, actually, among all the, you know, big tech leaders, I respect Jeff Bezos a lot of Amazon. In some way, uh, you know, one beautiful thing I think Amazon has been doing um, is they sort of had all their internal infrastructures and then they just developed that into a platform and then other, open it up to third party users, clients and other people pay for it and use it. So in some way, everything Amazon has ever done is a profit center and I think that's a very powerful um, business model. Jeff Bezos published a shareholder's letter recently in which he repeated his original shareholder's letter in which he told his stakeholders we are at day one, and we never want to be at day two. Day two is when you forget about the customer, you build processes, you build teams to do certain things, you become convenient. That is the beginning of decline. So Mark, in our therapy session here, was that painful advice, or is this a set of suggestions you're already thinking about? I think it was accurate, and I, I think it was welcome. You know, I, w I would actually fundamentally disagree with um, Jeff Bezos. You can see in rapidly growing startups that if you don't have a minimum of process in place uh, to take care of your employees, for example, or to figure out you know, how they interact with each other, things can go uh, terribly wrong. Um, I think it comes back to, first of all, trust. Just as you need to earn the trust of your users or your consumers, uh, and it can be lost in a heartbeat, 
uh, you need to do the same thing with the talent that you're acquiring uh, in order to retain that talent. And talent acquisition, uh, quite frankly, in the tech business is not that difficult, uh, whether you're an established player that's, that's trying to reinvent itself or whether you're a startup. Talent retention is something else. You know, it's, it's a myth that people join companies, especially uh, young, talented, well-educated, um, innovative people, uh, only to make money. Uh, startups have shown that people are willing to forego a decent salary uh, in order to participate in something bigger, in order to have this sense of mission. Uh, of course, there has to be some sort of payout uh, at the end, should the collective enterprise be successful. Uh, but it's the working conditions, it's how you treat your people uh, in terms of the culture of, of the enterprise. Uh, you know, Vion, we, as I said, we, we have the, 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 the number one or the number two mobile operator in, in all these great countries. Um, Pakistan, you know, we, we own and operate Jazz, which is uh, 54 million subscribers, you know, a quarter of the country's population. You go down to Islamabad, you go to one of the other cities, it's like visiting a pretty large startup. There's so much energy because people are, are, are really uh, well managed, people have really good working conditions, they're respected, uh, and they're treated as human beings, uh, albeit part of a, a, a bigger uh, mission and a bigger sense of purpose. So if you focus just on shareholder return, uh, if you focus just on the, the, the quarterly numbers, then I think you're doomed to failure. And I, I know that uh, Jimmy Wales is doing work with the World Economic Forum uh, on t inversing the pyramid uh, on which corporates have been uh, based in the past and focusing on purpose, people, and, and then profit. And I think if you espouse that approach in how you run your business, whether large or small, uh, I think then you have a, a, a high chance of retaining the talent uh, and being successful. I'm seeing a lot of mission-driven for-profit businesses that see it as a major advantage, not just in attracting the talent, and especially the 20-somethings who are often not motivated by financial rewards, they want to make a difference. But it also helps define the purpose of a startup and get it through the very difficult bits. I was talking to Aya Badir of Little Bits, who we wrote about, we put on the cover of Wired last year. She said it's really difficult building a startup because the highs are really high and the lows are really lows. If you have a defined purpose, it gets you through the short-term problems. Um, Andre, you have a second interesting role which is being the chief innovation officer for Switzerland, which is a rather successful and wealthy incumbent business. How do you approach this task? How do you ensure that a company that seems pretty comfortable, that seems pretty established, Switzerland PLC, can move as fast as some of its global competitors? There are innovation hubs everywhere from Berlin to Shenzhen to Tel Aviv. How do you make sure Zurich and Geneva and Lausanne are competing? So that's a pretty interesting question because Switzerland has decided uh, last year uh, effectively to completely redesign the innovation agency. So you have an innovation agency that have worked for more than 50 years and the idea was to completely build from scratch a new concept, using the existing staff, but changing and completely revamping the governance. And it's interesting to see that the concept of startup, even in government, can work as a concept. And the interesting element is that, for example, the existing agency was based to really focus on what is happening domestically and was, some people can say, an agency that was looking how to get some funding for research lab from university. And we are transforming it, and that was uh, uh, a political decision, to an entity that is first able to work globally with international cooperation because we cannot anymore look at innovation just from one country. And Switzerland is a special country. You do 200 kilometers in any direction, you find yourself in a different country. So we have understood since long time that we need to uh, look at what is happening outside of Switzerland. And so fundamentally to have an entity that is looking 
to have collaboration with what is happening outside of Switzerland, but also to have a system that is offering to start-up or SMEs the opportunity to access to research that is done in university or labs in a way that they can come with something that is disruptive. And so it's fundamentally a revamping of the existing element. And one thing very important in Switzerland, we consider that things are never forever, so we need to reinvent ourselves and to do the next step by being ready to take some risks. But it is nonetheless hyper-competitive between all these innovation hubs to attract but the talent. I, I would say that the first element is Switzerland has done pretty well in a hyper-competitive environment. Switzerland has some competitive disadvantage that is the strength of the Swiss franc. It's a relatively small country, but at the same time, each of the disadvantage has been turned in an advantage because people are ready to really do incredible things. But it's also, overall, a very open country. Today, you have 32% of the population in living in Switzerland that was not born in Switzerland. So Switzerland is much more open than many other countries. So if, if you look at the immigration, if you look at the diversity that you find in Switzerland, I think it's one of the most diverse you can find, at least in Europe. But let's just say your brief is to create the next Uber out of Switzerland, or the next Vion. You get to ask Yao to bring in 100 of her friends from both the Valley or China or any other places. What do you ask them to do to help create those conditions to create the billion franc, the billion dollar startups? So one of the key elements is to have the possibility to bring some talent. And here we have in Switzerland some issue because for the last few years that have been a really important immigration coming in. But we have finally found a way to deal between the internal constraints that we have in terms of politics and the needs uh, for the economy. Now, one thing that is pretty interesting is that in Switzerland, compared to many other countries, you have the freedom to hire and fire that is much more easy than in other places. And that is extremely important when you are interested to do innovation and to try some things, because if you are successful, you need to be able to hire a number of people. But if you have some issue or if you need to readapt yourself, you need to have the possibility to fire some people. So that's an example. And one thing that is extremely important is a good level of education not only for the very top people, but all uh, down the chain, you have people that are pretty well educated. So no pressure, Yao. <laughs> Andre has great universities, ETH, EPFL. He's trying to make it easier to get rid of people who no longer help take the company forward. You have now a shiny new office in Zurich where you can bring your 100 friends. But, but by the way, uh, Google has its largest center outside of the U.S. for R&D in Zurich. So just to yeah. give you a sense. But what do you see as the opportunity that maybe Andre hasn't thought through? Um, I actually had a, I mean, it's definitely one of the very attractive uh, um, places uh, for a global expansion. Um, so for the specific cases of Roboterra, we are growing fast in international market. We're serving clients in more than 30 countries, and then um, huge demand is coming from Europe. So indeed, location-wise, um, it actually makes sense for us already to consider. Um, and definitely, the, the, the talent quality is very, very attractive, the multi-languages. Um, and um, um, not, not to mention, actually, you know, the beautiful landscape, the beautiful view and everything that all makes um, living and working there attractive to talents. Another thing I want to mention, I noticed it's, it's quite different uh, about the talent mentality in, in, in several of the innovation hubs uh, that I heard about uh, compared to, you know, the places uh, in China or, or the Valley, which is actually employee loyalty. So, you know, so for a startup, it's actually very hard to imagine, okay, I'm gonna build a company that I'll keep all my employee with me for 20 or 40 years. It's just hard to imagine like that. However, I had friends uh, who also finished their, um, you know, training at uh, uh, grad school in the US and then they returned back to Berlin or other parts of Europe. And then they're saying uh, college students there, um, 
in, on one hand, um, the, the, the cost, for example, the, the, the salaries of a, of a software developer is not as high as the ones uh, has to be offered in the Valley. But on the other hand, those talents born in Europe, they tend to have more loyalty to, our, uh, to a company or organization or a group of people than for you know, organizations have in, in the Valley or, or China. So the turnover rate uh, for startups or even medium-sized, large-sized companies in China and the US is, being, uh, you know, is quite high. Um, yes, it's said that for the current generation, they're lifelong, they're gonna have seven to 10 jobs in their lifetime, but it seems that in, uh, for, for European uh, professionals, it's still, uh, you know, they still consider um, that if I choose a place to join, I want to stay as long as possible. It seems that that's a mentality European professionals would have. And I think for any business owner, that's definitely very attractive. Now I would just <laughs> add one point, and that is the surveys that we have done in our own organization. One of the two top elements that do that talents come and stay within our organization is the interesting work and to share with great colleagues. So it's basically saying that if you have a great colleague, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, environment, then people stay. They don't stay just for the company, but for the colleagues. And that is one of the most powerful uh, motivations that you can find. So one of the themes for our session is how you enable global innovation to grow beyond borders. And Vion has certainly grown, grown beyond many borders, but also your previous company, Uber, was a case study in very rapid expansion into many different markets, finding local teams to execute, but also creating hubs where specialist skills, so the AI, the work on maybe autonomous vehicles could work. And Mark, how do you see the um, value of creating particular localized teams in a globalizing business? Uh, I mean, that's a tough one. I think there has been a bit of a tendency to try and replicate in every uh, location. Uh, every, every location or every government or every city is trying to become uh, the, the local equivalent of si Silicon Valley. And I think that's maybe uh, missing the point. Uh, in different markets, you need to know, uh, you need to focus on what are the, s the, the real skills of the workforce. Uh, and of course, yes, going forward, it would be great if all governments and all universities and all high schools could have a stronger curricula on so-called STEM uh, subjects, science, technology, engineering, maths. It would be great if you could have coding um, as a requirement alongside uh, the, the domestic language and, and mathematics for all children. But not every country is going to create unicorns or decacorns uh, and I think that would be um, a misguided uh, ambition uh, for government. Um, you know, we are, as I said, in 12 countries, a quarter of a billion people uh, is our customer base. Um, so when, when you have a new idea for anything, it's great to be able to, you know, scale that across uh, your user population. But we have focused our digital engineering in London uh, and in Moscow uh, in particular, where you have, because of the local curricula, you have uh, particularly gifted, talented people in those domains. But it also goes to the, the legal and regulatory environment. Mm. Uh, you know, I remember 15 years ago, the, the head of R&D for Nokia, which at the time was a much bigger, much more successful global enterprise, uh, a guy called Bob Iannucci, who you know, was spending about $12 billion every year just on research and, and development. Uh, he was bemoaning the fact that the best and brightest and in, in the European workforce all wanted to get their PhDs and go to California because in Europe it was frowned upon uh, to want to be successful and, and, and make money. Uh, and the taxation system in, in, in the European Union countries in particular uh, is very punitive for people who are successful uh, and, and also the tax system is punitive uh, to startups that don't want to take cash out of the business today but want to reinvest it uh, in, in the future growth of the business. So, you create hubs based on the local talent or the talent that you can hire into that market, but also the regulatory conditions in terms of the, the, the legal parameters, the taxation parameters, uh, and also the general culture where uh, is it okay to take risk? Is it okay to, to fail? You know, you come back to Uber, the, the guy who founded Uber failed massively uh, in his first uh, endeavor and 
stood up and went back and tried something else because the culture of California was conducive to that sort of risk taking. So we've talked a lot about giving people permission to take informed risks and learn from those risks. We've talked a lot about creating effective feedback loops. We've certainly talked about the importance of talent in helping take a business to the next level as conditions change. We've talked about the importance of purpose and mission in attracting that talent. Um, we have quite a lot of gifted, talented people in the room, and I think we need to bring them into our ecosystem. So who in the room in their organization is trying to confront this very complicated beast called innovation? Anybody here is trying to bring innovation into their organization? Just indicate, we don't have to pick on you, but okay, there's a fair few hands. Um, do any of you want to share very briefly an approach you're taking that you think the rest of us can learn from in iterating, in modernizing, in creating new potential future revenue streams with this magical thing called innovation? We're all still learning, so nobody's going to judge. There's a case study. Just briefly tell us who you are, and then Good morning. share your experience. Good morning. Uh, Hello, I'm Sean Andrade from Lisbon, uh, and I work in the, um, uh, so I'm running a fintech VC, and uh, one of our LPs, it's a bank, um, and this bank, the way we, we are cooperating, it's three steps. The first one, it's uh, um, basically like something we call, or it's called in the industry, fin integration. So basically, uh, corporations can't build everything. So basically, it's integrating with startups things that they are really keen on, very good, very, very, very specific stuff, and integrate within your offer. Second thing, it's collaborating. So problems that you can solve, solve together, uh, because uh, you already got the customers, you got know-how. There are stuff that startups can't do. Imagine holding money from a bank. You don't have to create a bank or a banking license. Just use other guys. And third thing, invest. That's what I'm doing now. <laughs> Investing in fintechs. Uh, I'm, I'm responsible for that part. And actually, <laughs> Mark, I would like to ask you, like, what's the, the meeting point between uh, telcos and uh, banking? Because I think on future, we're going to see that channel super used because you guys are really struggling with our boost, so average return per user. So. I think it's uh, a low-hanging fruit. I don't know exactly how to do it, and I would like to listen to your opinion. Thanks. So, so, Mark, the question was, where do you see the finance part of telcos giving you new opportunities? Well, the, there's a great company here that's uh, a massive disruptor in the financial industry, which is actually 17 years old, called PayPal. And they've really they were at the origin of disrupting the old banking model where the banks owned the customers and the banks decided where, how, what time you could get access to money, you could borrow, you could invest. Where telecom meets the need uh, for people to, to bank uh, is really in the emerging markets in particular. You take Pakistan, 200 million people, a quarter of those 200 million people, a quarter of the, that population trusts us every day for their communications. It's a country where only 15%, one five, have access to a bank account. Either they don't earn enough for it to be you know, attractive uh, to bankers looking for constant profit, or because of a creaking, antiquated uh, commercial banking infrastructure. We already have eight million people out of our 54 million subscribers who don't need a bank account because through their mobile phone, they can invest, they can borrow, they can share money, they can transfer. So just as PayPal has disrupted banks, just as WhatsApp has disrupted old telecommunications uh, companies, the power of your liberty to do whatever it is you want to do is in your hand with your smartphone uh, in, in particular. That's, that's your tool. And I think what startups and corporates uh, should have in common is to look at every single aspect of daily life from moving around, from banking to eating to consuming, uh, and question, what are we being provided today? What are being, we being served? And say, why should it not be different? So if you look at financial services, the next wave of massive disruption of an incumbent industry 
is through uh, fintech uh, and mobile and digital financial services. And do you think in the company, in terms of maybe our business revenue in future is not through people paying for bandwidth, maybe our revenue in the future is selling financial services to the people who we have in our network? Yeah, our, our, our business, our profitability in the future is actually through partnership and through sharing. So it's not through owning the customer. It's not through these siloed business models of the past. It's by having an open interface. Uh, and if you can provide music to 250 million people, if you can provide financial services to 250 million through our platform, the Vion internet platform, well then everybody gets a fair share of the value that they provide. So owning the customer and these closed business models definitely are a thing of the past. Great. Another contribution from the room. We've learned a new word, fintegration. Any other education from the room? There's a hand over here. There's a microphone heading towards you in our drone. Just tell us briefly who you are. Hi, I'm uh, Rohit from AXA, which is a more traditional insurer who's trying to innovate. So we're doing all of it, right? We're doing telematics, AI, robotics, and so on and so forth. One of the things I've learned is whenever we go big bang with a big idea, it goes through this usual debate between the finance world and the innovation world in traditional companies. So the approach we have taken is let's do it in small chunks. Let's show success, and success is the best answer to getting more funding. So every time we do something small, people get excited. Wow, the AI works this way. Then we can build on it. And that supports the business case. So trying something radically different day one because of our legacy issues is far more difficult than doing it in phases. And then there's always the benefit of partnerships, which is partnering with FinTech companies. So yeah, does this sound the way to do it? Incremental steps, testing at each step of the way? Is that agile startup thinking? Um, it, it's, uh, it's one way of being agile, and I, I like uh, what, what, what he mentioned, that uh, you know, start something that can be even radically different. Uh, I think the spirit behind that is dare to try. If you see a new way or opportunities to, to, to address on some issues, then just have the determined people go do it and not be blocked because, oh, that's not my role, that's my re not my responsibility, I may lose you know, my recognition or whatever, so just, 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 you just have to deliver. I think that's the spirit. Andre, are you finding I ways to iterate? There is not one size fits all, and I think it depends on the market you are in, because some country you have the time to do incremental, and that is one of the best elements because you have a feedback back loop that can allow you to avoid to do too big mistakes. But if you take very large market, like US market, like Chinese market, if you do the thing too small at the beginning, you will definitely have someone that will do that faster by putting more means. So what you need to consider, you are not the only one in the market and if you have one that uh, is putting a little bit of money and the other one that is putting much more, then you have a high chance to be uh, yourself uh, disturbed. It's a very fair point, yeah. I mean, when you're building a business as a startup, you discover a market that other people don't know, and suddenly there are 100 competitors. How do you make sure you stay ahead of the competition? Uh, very good question. So, you know, so, so I think uh, for me as an entrepreneur, before you enter into a market, yes, it does. Y you need to form insights about the segment you're going into. As I mentioned, that uh, I think uh, whether it's uh, it's you know innovative technology model, business model, service model, that uh, you should be able to know you are working on something that's multiple times better than what's existing solutions. Um, and then when you are multiple times better, and then Yes, if it's a good enough market, similarly, with the best people, you still have to work really hard, if not, you know, be, you know, work, work the hardest, so that uh, you have a chance to win. Because for a startup, I, I think for, for my team, from the beginning, we know uh, there's no guarantee of success. Which, if we have the belief, we, we, we just keep working on it. So. Are you finding RoboTerra competitors emerging? Um, we definitely are um, very strong in, where, in our market, and then we're growing fast. Cool. Thank you for the question. We have space for another one or two. There's a hand over here. Introduce yourself, sir. Yes, I come from Tsinghua University. 
We are running a very big science park. We have incubators around China, about 100. We saw thousands of new business grows up every day. So my question for the panelists is, the people always want to live it longer and longer. But for the today's work, do you think the company, keep the company as long as possible is a good, good effort? And put it another way, if I give you a certain amount of resource, you use this resource to keep your company as long as possible, or you want to use this resource to start something new, please. Especially for the company have 45,000 people. Uh, are you going to keep for another 100 years? So Mark, do you want to volunteer to shut down Vion and build something <laughs> new, or do you think a big company should be planning for its own future? I think in, in China, 45,000 people company would qualify as an SME. Um, <laughs> But you know, we, we were 60,000 two years ago. Uh, in order to build this digital business, you have to uh, be able to afford to hire the digital talent. So you adapt your business model, you adapt your, your workforce. I can guarantee you that five to 10 years from now, Vion will be doing something radically different to what then Vimpelcom set out to do in 1992. So you have to constantly reinvent yourself. And if you stop providing a useful service, if your raison d'être uh, no longer is valid, then you go bust uh, and, and you die. Um, so, you know, the 45,000 people who come to work at Vion every day, they wonder what is their purpose. And they're connecting a quarter of a billion people, which is it's something to, to motivate you and get you out of bed and you want to go in and you want to keep innovating. Uh, and what those 45 or 40 or 35, it doesn't matter the size of the company, uh, but the purpose of the private sector in particular is to continue to innovate and think outside the box and question why not. As long as you're doing that, then uh, I think you know, your future is, is guaranteed. Maybe a useful way of understanding this um, is, is what I call reframing the value of a business. Um, I'm seeing a lot in my quest of companies that realize the market they're in is becoming commodified, but they still have certain value that maybe they can turn into the business that becomes bigger than today's business. And just as a couple of examples, um, there's a bank in Finland called Op. Banking is becoming commodified. It's just opened for private hospitals. Because if you have the trust that a bank has of your customers, you will trust that bank to build the sorts of businesses that look after you in difficult times. There's a bank in Denmark, Danske Bank, that's just opened a series of new ventures. One of them is a way to help you find your home, not just to help you finance your home, but it's an app that helps you see the right property for you. And then it guides you through that whole difficult process of buying a home, modernizing the home. So it's not doing what a bank does. The most interesting example I've seen of radically creating businesses that add value there's an airline in Australia called Qantas, which is in a very difficult space. The airline business, you have uncertainty about fuel prices. You have the low-cost carriers launching against you. They realized they have a fantastic value store in their loyalty program, which at 11 and a half million members has about half the population of Australia. So it's like the second currency in Australia. They've now got a unit, I think of about 120 people, building businesses on the loyalty program, a health insurance business, a life insurance business, which have much better relative profit rates than the, par the parent business. So I think it is possible for people running big successful businesses to kind of take it in a slightly different direction. But, but I, I would just add that the, sort of our parents' generation, companies were built you know, like Ford was built, you know, for centuries uh, upon a particular m business model. You know, to come to the question of, of the, the, the academic, the gentleman uh, from the university, I would view corporate entities today almost like cities. They are hubs or they are actually natural hosts for lots of individuals with dreams, with ambitions who will come and go. Very few people in this room under the age of 35 will have one career, one job. They will stay two, maximum three years with any one corporate uh, entity. Uh, and I think it's really you know, understanding that change and keeping pace with it uh, that, uh, that is important. We probably have space for another contribution. I see 
Vera. Anybody here from the startup world? No startup entrepreneurs in the room? There's an opportunity. Here's a startup entrepreneur. I just want, I, I just want to introduce yourself, and um, I just want to get what you would do to make both Andre's business and Mark's business um, likely to be here in 30, 40 years. Yeah. Um, good morning. I'm João Romão from Portugal. I was a startup company called Again Social, which is a social analytics platform. Uh, and what I feel from the corporate world, so we work with uh, companies like Adobe, uh, Forbes, Sky, Media, uh, which are very large companies that ultimately came to us to get a source of innovation and ideas to their businesses. So, um, and what I feel like from these worlds, uh, more legacy or bigger companies, is that they're there's a drive for innovation, but they're still looking for those fast-moving companies, startup companies, just to get a hand of what's there, what's new to do, and how can you help us guide um, our, our innovation, our business. So what I feel is that, is, is that we're, as startups, we're being that source of new ideas and faster moving uh, mechanisms to develop these older businesses. But I do feel that they have uh, an open window to hear us and to get a feeling of what we can do with them and not for them. So it's not, it's not a supplier-customer relationship, it's a partnership that we're creating with them. And that's uh, really good for smaller companies like ours. Thank you, it's a good point. Do you see, Andre, the value in these partnerships? Of course, because I think that if you just limit uh, yourself on what you see within your organization, you miss a very important part of the ecosystem. So the best way to have your internal innovation as competitive as possible is to benchmark with the best of the best. And so fundamentally, that is creating an emulation. Now, I would just like to also insist on another element that is extremely important if you want to keep your talent motivated, is to give them the possibility every few years to change their job within the organization. So to say that after 20 or 30 years, uh, talent will have changed five or 10 times his job within the organization. So right. just to say that you need to think about mobility in a new way. So last word from our expert leaders on the panel. If you could leave the audience with one concrete takeaway, one piece of advice that they could go back to their organizations and implement to try and help that organization think more like a startup, what would it be? Just in a, in a minute, tell us. Yes. Um, so as a Chinese entrepreneur um, working in the Valley and then expanding business back to China, um, I actually has been quite surprised by really how fast the Chinese society has been changing. So obviously given the population size, Chinese market and then you know, market in the US and many other parts are all significant. But uh, um, I just, you know, like recently I've, I've been, you know, really just living a, a cashless lifestyle. What, each time when I came to China, the shareable bikes and then the communications, everything based on WeChat or Alipay. Um, how people are doing transactions, providing services on a peer-to-peer -peer, um, structure is so dramatically different compared to before. Even for Roboterra as a startup, we're also trying to understand what, what does all this mean to the younger generation's purchasing of services. So I think it's important for all of us, now we're all in China, pay attention to this, try to understand that. So, so that monitor that. behavioral change. 30 yeah. seconds, Andre. One piece of advice. First, don't let the other one disrupt your business, disrupt it yourself first. <laughs> now, just to say, fundamentally, you should not just look at the existing competition, but who may be a potential competitor. And don't forget, one of the greatest opportunity of disruption is not fundamentally just technology, is a business model. So think about disruptive business models. Very powerful advice. Last word to Mark. Think, think of uh, your business as, uh, as a bus ride uh, or an Uber journey. You're going to share your journey with a couple of people for a while 
uh, you need to make it work. It's about the culture, it's about the values, it's about what are we going to achieve together in a short period of time. And I think that's got, got to be your horizon. I think that's what pe keep people motivated. So if my job is to conclude this wide-ranging, lively debate, which is kind of a challenging, disruptive task, I'm going to go with the phrase that Yao threw into the discussion a bit earlier, which is dare to try. With that, thank you to our expert panelists. Thank you to you in the room. Let's hope we can bridge the startup corporate world in creative, value-building ways.